All right. Why, while still uh, folks are joining us, let me get us started. It is um, 4 p.m. Eastern time and 10 p.m. here in Berlin. Um, how how late is it for you, Rudy? 11 p.m. 11, One and hour I think, ahead, yeah. Anna, you're at 9 o'clock, right? 9, 9 p.m. All right, well. Um, it is time for the Washington History Seminar. Good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to this session of the Washington History Seminar, Historical Perspectives on International and National Affairs. This afternoon, we will speak with Dr. Radoslav Yordanov about his new book, Our Comrades in Havana, Cuba, the Soviet Union, and Eastern Europe, 1959 to 1991 published earlier this year by Stanford University Press in the Cold War International History Project series. We are uh, also being joined by Dr. Anna Kalori to give, she will provide initial comments as a start into a discussion that we hope will involve many of you in the audience. A warm welcome to both of you to the Washington History Seminar. I'm Christian Osterman. I direct the Wilson Center's History and Public Policy Program. And I have the pleasure, uh, as I've had for years now, to co-chair this seminar with GW's Eric Arneson, who represents the American Historical Association. Today, Eric will, int will introduce our speakers and moderate the discussion. The Washington History Seminar is a collaborative effort of two organizations, the American Historical Association and the Wilson Center's History and Public Policy Program since 2010, the seminar has served as a nonpartisan forum for the discussion of important new historical insights and publications. Behind the scenes, the Wilson Center's Peter Bierstecker is key to producing this event. Uh, thank you, Peter. Uh, we'd also like to acknowledge our supporters and we welcome your support. Details of, <clears throat> about how to support the seminar are available in the uh, chat right now or simply go to our institutional websites. I'd like to invite you to join us for the next session this coming Monday, September 23rd, when we will discuss Sheda Yahanbani's award-winning book, The Poverty of the World, Rediscovering the Poor at Home and Abroad. A word on uh, the, the uh, um, process here today, the proceedings. The session will be recorded, will soon appear on our organization's websites. For the Q&A part of this webinar, please use the raise hand function in the Zoom functionality. And if you'd like to ask a question or make a comment, um, you, once you press the button, you'll be queued and the moderator will call on you uh, once it's your turn. Once you receive the prompt, please unmute yourself. Um, uh, you have to press the yes button, I think, in most cases. Otherwise, you won't be able, we won't be able to hear you. You can also use the Q&A function in the Zoom room, but please do not use the chat function. And with that, I turn our Zoom room over to my co-chair, Eric Arneson. Eric, it's all yours. Thank you, Christian. And unlike my colleagues on this uh, program, uh, I'm actually in Washington, D.C. Uh, and in uh, Eastern Time, uh, where it's now 4.04. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, our author this afternoon, Radoslav Yordanov, who completed his doctoral studies at Oxford University, defending a thesis on Soviet involvement in Ethiopia and Somalia, 1947-19. 91. This thesis served as the basis for his first monograph published in the Harvard Cold War book series. Following various stints at the Russian Academy of Sciences Institute of World History, Columbia University's Harriman Institute, the Institute of Cuban History in Havana, and the Davis Center, Rudy completed his second book, Investigating Soviet Bloc and Cuban Relations During the Cold War, and it's published by Stanford University Press this, this year. His work has appeared in numerous peer-reviewed journals, including the Journal of Cold War Studies, Third World Quarterly, the Journal of Contemporary History, International History Review, International Affairs, and the Journal of Iberian and Latin American Studies, as well as other outlets. This afternoon, he is speaking on his latest book, Our Comrades in Havana, Cuba, the Soviet Union, and Eastern Europe, 1959 to 1991. Rudy? Welcome to the Washington History Seminar. First of all, thank you very much. 
for the organizers for having me here, for giving me this opportunity to have this conversation with you. Uh, Anna, thank you as well for signing up and for everybody joining in. So today, in about 30 minutes, we have to cover have to cover quite a bit of ground. And I'll do my best not to weave too much, because there is a lot of work today. And allow me to share a little presentation I conducted for you today. And let's see how it goes. And I hope you can hear me all well, loud and clear. OK. So a few words before I start. Basically, this project has been internalized for quite a while, probably a little bit more than I would have wanted. After spending four years in numerous archives in Central and Eastern Europe, in I was, by the end of the fourth year, Let's, let's say I was lost. There was so much to take on board. Cuba was virtually everywhere. You turn a page, you might be browsing information on Libya, but what, what the heck they're talking about Cuba? Right, then I came to realize that probably I need to wade a little bit deeper and see what is this all about. After the Horn of Africa, now it's Thursday, and what is a Thursday without a throwback? I will throw back here and there uh, in a while uh, about my experience in studying the Soviet affairs in, in the Horn of Africa. And while it was mainly about the Soviets, where it was the main uh, driver of the narrative, here with, uh, with the Cuba project, I asked myself, can I make this a glorified footnote as it was once uh, the Eastern Europeans' uh, involvement in the Cold War uh, viewed us? Say, one prominent author, Andrzej Kolbonski, said the Eastern Europeans didn't make a great deal. The history wouldn't change even if they weren't there. As an Eastern European myself, I didn't take offense. But I said, maybe I should look closer. Gladly, Wilson Center helped with the my research in Cuba. I ended up 2018 on the islands, and the first thing I discovered was the fountain of youth. You see a middle-aged guy in the, his late 30s feeling like 10. For those of you who lived through the book, probably would recognize this 10-year-old lad learning how to swing bats with his Cuban uh, trainer, Jorge. So this 30-year-old uh, uh, guy finding himself in, in, in Cuba, felt he was returning to his youth. But not in a, the way, perhaps, and again, I would have wanted. I remember the queues outside the supermarkets, the empty shelves, I mean, filled with all the same products to imitate abundance. I remember the Jigulis. I remember uh, the Icarus, the articular Icarus buses, which, Castro, Fidel, hated so uh, profoundly. All this came back to me as I, I felt like this uh, out-of-body experience. Frankly, I was in Cuba not so much to uh, gather new information. I had plenty already, but kind of like looking for this mini Eureka moments. I had a million and one research idea, but I didn't have the idea. And this nice and few of uh, pericentric research, which started like over two decades ago, uh, has produced some very important books uh, lately. And I felt like in, in a way, not so much to respond, uh, but to be part of the, the conversation and put Cuba and, and, and Eastern Europe uh, out there. So how did I do that with so much information and so uh, little focus to it? Looking for all these mini Eureka moments. How should I approach it? As, a, as starting off with the multipolar archival research, like I said, I had many conflicting supporting views from Budapest, from 
uh, Warsaw, from Sofia, from East Berlin. But what was the common denominator? What was the thing that united all this? I knew I didn't want to write separate stories or histories of uh, those uh, separate countries uh, and their dealing with the Cubans. I knew it's probably not going to be the way uh, to, uh, to develop the narrative. So taking some clues, I will throw back to uh, the Horn of Africa, something that I'd probably refer to as a reportage diplomatique. I, I wanted to put to the fore uh, what, I, what I see as a real cold warriors, the diplomats on the ground, who are well known for their lavish lifestyle, uh, going from one seminar or cocktail to another, uh, we all imagine that, but we seldom think probably about the nitty gritty work behind it, about the data ga gathering, about the, the rep representative role that they play. Uh, we seldom think of these technologies we have today, the typewriters, the, the, the way they were typing those reports, especially if you are high up in the, in the hierarchy, you will dictate. But then if your typewriter make a mistake, you have to redo it. And when you read those documents, you see how this was created. You see the history. You you feel it. So your reportage diplomatique was, was the way to go, and not from looking from each country's perspective, but trying to see uh, this common denominator to see uh, just to to drive uh, the event, to drive the narrative, not the country, not the actor. Thus. Seeing the, the, the story evolving from below, not from the grassroots, but rather from below the way it was created. Once again, the other thing I wanted, uh, wanted to uh, do with this project. But then the question is, where do I start? And where I started, not so much in the in Minrexa archive, in an uh, archive of the foreign ministry in Cuba or in the uh, couple of dozens of other archives, but I used every moment I strolled down El Centro, Habanero, just to look at the people, uh, not to imagine myself uh, with any, any note of presentism as, as a diplomat in, in Havana, but just to, just to see from this anecdote of, uh, of Cuba, what I perceived uh, El Centro, uh, see how they behaved, see how, how they acted. And what I saw, the, the, the thing I saw was something that really fascinated me because it was it's not something that I expected, even though I did not recognize it from my childhood. Uh, I, I explained a couple of visual tidbits that really impressed me for how unimportant and how minuscule in the grand scheme of things they were, but how interesting, original, and outside of the box they were. I was talking about a guy having like a paintbrush and just Apply varnish to his old price jiguli. And I said, who cares? What cares? Is this how it's supposed to be done? What really impressed me is not how he did it, but he didn't care. He just did it with pride. And then I said, maybe there is something to this Cuban exceptionalism, this uh, immense pride. There was so much talked about. And then I was having like this great opportunity, but then again, something that really stressed me on uh, of uh, giants and social science and humanities who worked on this topic and looked at Cuba in various angles, in every possible angle that that was that could have been like imagined for, for its size. Uh, Cuba was probably one of the most discussed uh, countries uh, in, in, in the second half of the, tw the 20th century. Uh, so basically, looking over the shoulders of those giants uh, was one way to go. The other way to go was to look for the keyhole. Obviously, I would have, I would have had a very much a vignetted perspective, uh, a very much of a focused perspective. And there is where I just wedged myself really uh, into the thinking that I really wanted to look upon the ground. And what really gave me this uh, possibilities was actually putting flesh to the bone of the, of, the, of the hundreds of thousands of pages. Literally, yes, who does this? Yeah. 
<laughs> I did it. Uh, collecting over the past, uh, over the course of the like uh, uh, four years in Eastern Europe, I had the point of view, I had the vista, but then I had to face biases, a myriad of biases. First one, which I listed last uh, on the fine print here, is a psychological bias. And I started off with how this guy in his 30s felt like he was 10 again. This was a serious, serious thing to contend. Was I, as a guy who had his first seven years in the dying days of communism, the right guy to do it? Could I uh, display that sufficient level of scholarly detachments? You know, when you were little, there are like milestones which you remember. One of the milestones I remember, I'm kidding you not, is when I heard that Tolojiku was toppled. It was, I remember it. I didn't understand it at the time, but I remember. So this guy with so much baggage, couldn't he really write about Eastern European relations with Cuba? Yeah, I mean, there was like, you know, quite a few red flags out there for me personally. Then the other one was the survivorship. Uh, by us, which is quite quite very important, and we all know it's not so much what the documents say, but what they don't say. It's not so much important what documents we find, but what documents we mystify. How they survive is as question as important as why didn't they survive? But there is also a question of availability. We know what happened on twenty fourth of. Uh, February 2022. Yes, hindsight is 2020. The, the book was already in the late stage of editing. It was like almost baked. But then I, I, I felt I could still graze and browse for a little bit more. This obsessive compulsive thought that if you turn page 1 million and 10, on the page 1 million and 11, you will find the truth, the holy grail of the truth. Should be the thing that keeps us going, not to some people's mind. And then the availability was in a way left to what it was. And now going forwards, we know these methodological questions are very important. And particularly I would like, if you allow me to give another throwback probably uh, 15 years ago, maybe more as a, as a, as a graduate student. It was the Wilson Census uh, archives collection that drew me into this. Before that, I was into elections and political developments. It can't be any different than that. So the Horn of Africa was the, the, the first collection, the big collection, uh, the, I still remember it, 2005. It was Bulletin 8-9. It was like, you know, this, you would sense it like a career change in moments, in a way, in the, in the career, even still not existing. Uh, basically, uh, the availability going forward for all of us who are in, in, uh, interested in this, into uncovering the mysteries of our very recent past, of which we know so little every time we dig deeper, uh, would present us with a, with a, probably a fewer opportunities than we had in the last 20 years. And we know the objective uh, role for that. I am, however, thrilled to see so many uh, colleagues uh, and so many good examples of scholarship uh, mushrooming uh, during the pandemic times and continuing to do so, uh, particularly focusing on Eastern Europe. Uh, GDR is one of those cases uh, which really catches uh, the attention, but Romain is not less uninteresting. Bulgaria, why not? You know, they, the dictum, what all dictums, when someone in Moscow sneezes, Sofia catches pneumonia. I know it's too soon, and talking lightly about pneumonia is not the way to go. But Bulgaria is also an interesting case, and one case or another, in one event or another, they proved so in, in the short timeline I, I will share with you in, in a while. But before I turn the page, or rather slide, 
allow me to just go a little bit into the debates and arguments I wanted to uh, kind of delve into. Cold War is the national, international history. It's the mainstay of the Wilson Center. And it was like one of the, the major methodological uh, shifts of the past 30 years in looking at the Cold War. Latin America Cold War, this is a, a new debate uh, basically uh, attempting to uh, look at the, uh, the regionalizing, uh, looking at the different compartments and problems of each country. Cuba played arguably a very important role here, drawing the East much closer than it would have had uh, the nasty to do. So, uh, so it really blends into into this uh, into this mid. Pericentrism connects uh, as well with this, trying to uh, look at the outskirts of empire, to look at the uh, outbounds of empire and the outliers. Uh, look not so much as uh, into uh, the, the push and pull, the tug of war uh, between Washington uh, and Moscow, but see what the periphery and the first, the strides weren't so grand to look so openly uh, and would em embrace there was what we call now global south, however a mis misnomer this is, but what was then uh, termed again misnomically as third world, so pericentric Framework was an added uh, um, away, uh, outlet uh, for, for us, and for me particularly, uh, to try and, and break the mold uh, and in a way to bring as many actors as possible what this multipolar archival research would normally allow. And here comes the, the, the axial analysis. Uh, usually we don't see, we, are, we recognize uh, East, South, uh, east-west axis, but we don't tend to talk too often about north-south in the context of Cold War, which is a construct of more modern times. However, Castro was one of the proponents of this, and basically it was one of uh, the idea he tried to, to fashion within the, the group of 77, uh, and especially uh, later on, like trying to press on uh, with the idea of developing socialist country, uh, basically uh, creating a kind of like an a Frankenstein of concepts, uh, you which for which he, he fought to a nail uh, for twenty years prior to that, and then on a on a macro level, and I would like to connect this with the, the view from below, uh, was the the role of socialist diplomacy uh, in particular and diplomacy at large. Uh, it played in uh, interstate relations during the Cold War. And then uh, I would again mention these real Cold War years, the guy behind the typewriter. Uh, I wanted to set, to, to, to check this dynamic and see how it worked. And this is a very schematic. You've already noticed uh, the, the greenish ones uh, and not to American Historical Association, as the, the, the main events. But they're like a couple of red dots, three, perhaps. Not perhaps, they are. Uh, that were quite important. I call them triggers. They're, these are not necessarily ones that are more important than the others. But uh, you see the curve. It goes as a sinusoidal. It's not like a bell shape as uh, the, the 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 sentiment I encountered in 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 uh, in the Horn of Africa. It was like you know many ups and downs. Uh, some ups not so distinguishable. Others more. Uh, sometimes relations were going down the crevice. Uh, some other times were really skyrocketing. And this this subjective judgment of the temperature of the relations and how do I how did I judge this temperature? Just by reading those reports. And they were interesting, really. I mean, yeah, uh, and as you as you read and as you go by, uh, as you turn page after page, you learn actually to know which document perhaps was more important than the other, written from the position of time when it was written not from the point of view now, because uh, we don't usually, if we judge an importance of a document by its classification mark, my, uh, more often than not, we we'll, might end up disappointed. But what was my, what was the, 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 the common ground I was going for? 
the shabbier document looks, the more fingerprints I could recognize in it, the more scribbles I could see. If it was like a, a, a report written in a hurry, to me it signified, some, significant, signified something. It was written under very pressing circumstances. Those were the things I really, really caught my attention. I just, you one gets to develop the field. Uh, uh, and then the, the, the sentiment emerges. We see when uh, Batista uh, fled uh, Havana uh, and um, uh, Che, uh, and rather Che, che uh, not Che, but uh, Fidel Castro and Camille, which you can see in the first picture, entered on the 8th of January, uh, socialists, uh, East European uh, countries and, and Moscow, they were not quite sure what to make of the situation. First, they did not have the eyes on the ground. They were relying mostly on information based on, uh, on their friends on the ground, which was Partido Socialista Popular, and we knew that they didn't go necessarily well uh, with Castro's uh, movements. So there was a great deal of things for them to discover. Later, how did the, 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 the Soviets initiate uh, the, the, the move? Because, you know, Voroshilov, in the early stages when uh, Castro entered, he was quite disappointed. And we learned this from the Hungarians. Uh, Voroshilov was quite disappointed that that the Cubans didn't respond to his telegram uh, congratulating him for their success. And then he said, yeah, we need to take, that's a proactive move here. And then we, we, uh, we need to take the matter in our hands. We send a guy, but we're not going to send that like a career diplomat. We're going to say some relatively unknown guy, uh, a shadowy figure, uh, Alexander Alexeyev. Uh, usually those guys are sent either as a trade attaché or as a press attaché. It was uh, rather uh, the latter. They met Alexander uh, Alexeyev uh, and Castro, um, met in uh, Havana Livre. And the conversation was very dry, um, not very cordial. And Castro said, we don't want to get really close to you guys because we need to figure out ourselves first and you know who's in, in our backside. Uh, referring to uh, obviously the United States. Uh, this was uh, at the moment where Havana Libre was the, the headquarters. Uh, and how did they? How did they have? How did they break the mold? The Soviets that were. They said, "Okay, we hear you. We're not going to go and open embassy straight away. We're going to send, um, say, exhibition." a trade exhibition, industrial exhibition, just we're going to show you what we can do for you guys uh, if one day you decide uh, to, to develop a relationship further. Three months later, we know who came, a very important guy, a VIP of the higher sorts. Number two, Mikuyan. Mikuyan came and he was the solid with the, with the same. With the, with the Cubans. He was he was having this uh, out of body experience, very similar to what I felt like he was feeling I like was back in his youth, like his, his revolutionary days. Uh, when he returns, he said, We need to help these guys. How they will tell us. First thing they wanted was obviously arms. We will see him a bit later. That's Throughout the 30 years, military arms was not the main tool of enticement. It was subsidies, it was economic aid, uh, but not the military arms. And then things, uh, as you can see, those of 1961, and I, I don't know how I'm pacing myself. I, I hope not being like too circumstantial. But those 1961 things started really to change. I mean, between 51, 59 and 61, a very important occasion was the uh, the, the Congress of the uh, Partido Socialista Popular. Czechoslovak uh, delegation was sent. 
important food move. Why was Shrek? Well, Shrek because they didn't want to kind of like be very ostentatious. They you know, just to be like in your face. They needed to go like to, to keep a low profile, someone who was trusted, and just to verify the situation on the ground. Blas Roca Caldera, the boss, spoke then already in, in August 60, very well at Castro. Probably giving one of the the, the seals of approval, the first seals of, of, uh, of approval uh, for Castro at the time. Czechoslovaks picked this up very quickly. Transmitters flew back to Prague and by association to Moscow. The wheels were starting to turn slowly. And then came 1961. Uh, James Hirschberg wrote um, very convincingly, and we verified this in, in the writings of the Eastern Europeans and as well the, of, uh, of uh, Moscow officials of the, the, of the need to defend Cuba. 1961 was the time after um, the, the, the disruption of, the, of economic relationship with the, with the partial embargo or blockade and very pejorative way it was like used in, in Cuba, the blockade. El blockade was a, a blockade, a, a, which was in their mind equal to, to a currency. The currency they, uh, they met in October uh, during a very infamous uh, two weeks that uh, in which Khrushchev and Kennedy were eyeball to eyeball. In 1961, the important trigger was not so much the Playa Hirón, but the pronouncement of the Cuban Socialist Revolution. Yes, Che Guevara spoke about this only, but he was the leader Mahimok who said it, and it was important for, for those guys. Alexeyev was the first who, even before the end of the 18th, they spoke. He sent dispatches back, uh, say, now is the time, now is the time. That's the first trigger. But then we know that the Cuban Missile Crisis came in. Uh, we are so much being written about. And it's so well. Uh, it is, um, uh, could be other angles that we could discover. Uh, and basically, uh, I, I, I benefited uh, enormously and uh, I'm so happy uh, with, the, with the collection available at uh, the digital archive uh, with great wealth of insight uh, from virtually all sides. However, from the missile crisis, they were like in a, some very minute, small point as expressed by Eastern Europeans that were, weren't very happy about. It. They weren't happy as much Castro wasn't happy with, uh, not as much as Castro wasn't happy when uh, Khrushchev and uh, Kennedy struck a deal behind his back for, for the termination of the, uh, uh, of the standoff. Uh, but the Eastern Europeans were not happy that they were kept in the dark. Obviously, very few people knew uh, about what was going on. Uh, Castro role the Castro's rule and, and Fidel, uh, Carlos, Rafael, uh, Carlos Rafael Rodriguez uh, knew. Uh, they were kept on the loop. But apart from that, great many more didn't know than knew. And in this episode, things didn't quite go well in, in what uh, Svetlana Sadronsky and Selma Mikhail uh, wrote about uh, the missiles of November. Uh, it is like a psychological um, uh, event of psychological importance for both sides. Miku Yan, that was the second trip of his in as many years. Far more challenging, far more difficult than the first. He already knew who was dealing with. If in, uh, if, uh, in 1960, he was feeling back in his youth. In 1962, he only not he lost his wife but he probably got quite a few more gray hairs than he already had. 
that was point when when we see the sentiment going down. That was the time between night in, in the mid 1960s, which we generally refer to, uh, with the term that some people scoff at, some people sneeze at, as the export of revolution. It might be a way of uh, discussing it or viewing it as a way of Castro taking revenge. The Tricontinental uh, Conference in 1966 was a way of demonstrating the Cuban way in Havana Libre and in the first official headquarters, unofficial headquarters of the, of the, of the rebels, uh, what they can do for the world. And that's not under Soviet tutelage. That was not under Eastern Europeans' uh, approval of any means in any sort. Uh, many, many reports containing not so dignified language uh, in the address of uh, the Cuban leadership were written about the time from our Eastern European friends. That was a very, uh, a relatively low point the sentiment that was uh, driving the story I was going for. Uh, Chess, uh, che Guevara's death uh, in Bolivia was a point that raised some eyebrows across the board. GDR, East, uh, East, uh, East Berlin was quite a bit incensed that the Cubans weren't very forthcoming about details about his death. The way they perceived it and um, angered uh, Havana was they tried to just you know swipe it under the rug for whatever reason. Not so long after that, and um, we see it dipping further down, uh, digging down in on a, a sentiments uh, chart. The micro faction affair, uh, we know uh, Escalante was a guy who was uh, an old communist uh, functionary. He was quite ambitious, but he was kind of like believed to be playing like a, probably a double game. He was probably believed to be siding with the Soviet side at the time when that was a, do uh, a dogma that was not allowed to happen. That's a, a point in the 68s where we really didn't see a much positive spark of going on. Uh, on another uh, occasion, again, I'm going through this uh, chronology. Uh, it's not so much well known as the Cologne. Uh, Korea Cologne uh, was a, a mere attache, not belittling the post. It could be very important, of course, depending on the background of the mission involved. But Korea Cologne was. Uh, uh, an attaché in a Mexican embassy in, in Havana. And it was kind of like, you know, the Cubans have a chip on their shoulders about him. I believe they was like acting on behalf of the CIA. Uh, what Carrillo Colón's great uh, problem with the Cubans was that he was quite uh, outspoken about his talks behind the scenes with the Eastern Europeans, particularly implicating the Czechoslovaks and the Bulgarians. And remember, this is the time that's happening like, you know, months, mere months uh, after the, mm, the Prague Spring. And he was uh, using like uh, a, a language that was not very dignified uh, um, and didn't speak well for the Cuban uh, leadership and the way they, they tackled, uh, the, and the way they tackled the, uh, the Prague Spring, uh, and the, the main argument she uh, shared with the Cuban press, uh, with, uh, with the press, was that the, uh, that Castro shouldn't have uh, supported uh, the Warsaw uh, Pact invasion, the Poland of Poland uh, of Czechoslovakia, because Czechoslovakia was always on the side of Cuba uh, from the late nineties, and we slowly but surely. We are going to the second very important trigger on this uh, timeline. It's debatable. Uh, some might say that probably the joining of the, of the Comcon was more important than the 10 uh, million tons of uh, the harvest. I would argue, uh, we can have a later conversation why it was so, but it was an event one may argue or imagine that was in response to what happened uh, with the microfaction or with uh, 
the, the, the limitation of, uh, of, of what the, the, the Soviets put to the uh, all the liveries. Uh, so there is like, a, in, in, in a way, this particular period in the close uh, uh, years of uh, the 1960s was looked upon as, yes, uh, the Soviets turned the screw with the, uh, all the liveries, and that's what precipitated the, the, the change in tack of the Cuban revolution. Yes, but maybe there was like an intermediary step. Intermediary step was the, the suffer. It was so ambitious that the question was, why was it done in 1970 for the 1970 harvest? It could have been done in 1965 or 1964 when uh, the first inkling of it was uh, shared. Uh, but what happened particularly after the, 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 the tumultuous uh, late 60s? Answer is, Similarly to the trico, similarly to, uh, to the so-called export of revolution, Castro failed, as revengeful as he was, to score it even. Uh, but the problem was different. He wanted to make a case. Carlos Rafael uh, spoke about uh, the Safra being the second revolution, was so important. Uh, for, for the revolution, he spoke, even in, in mid-1960, he spoke about the soldier, uh, the soldier uh, who was cutting cane. He was not firing bullets, he was cutting cane. And it was so, so important, these cane cutters were the new revolutionaries. However, the problem was they didn't, not so manage it well. They couldn't have managed, they couldn't have made it, because it was a as a political stint, like no other exercise in the past decade. The result was quite predictable, and the writing of Eastern European diplomats were quite telling, quite revealing. They saw that mismanagement of the economy was not so much based, not particularly with the suffering itself, but throughout the decade, was uh, precipitated to not so much to objective factor, not so much to the um, to the great deal of uh, imposition of this monocultural model that was uh, surviving uh, pre-revolutionary times, but more so than was due to subjective factors. And there we come to reiterating the, the, the theme of educating the need to educate the need to tame the need to uh keep their cuban comrades not so much in check but to guide them steer them in the right execution uh of a planned economy but how do you do planned economy if you're not a part of the uh, uh if you don't have a planned economy first if you don't have the uh the know-how and if you're not part of uh of the, the the, the supernatural organization that governs it. Fast forward two years, we see, uh, as we see on our chart, a gradual uh, warming of the sentiment. We see some sun shining in between uh, the, 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 the three partners, between the converts. But uh, that, how did this happen? It happened gradually and then suddenly. The sudden moment was July when it was admitted, when Cuba was admitted to, uh, to the uh, CNEA. But it was actually following on events of 1972, but months prior to that, probably three months in, in which uh, already, so I would argue that this decision was made not so much in a hurry, but in a very last moment, uh, in, in this particular moment between uh, 1972, in, in where they said, after uh, Castro visited uh, all Eastern European countries in, in the spring and, and early summer and Soviet Union uh, in 1972, in which they, they saw the promise in Castro and his policies, uh, but they saw also the problem. So Rudy, how would you... Yes? If I could interrupt for a moment, I have my eye on the clock. And I'm wondering if we could shift to uh, Anna's questions uh, and then perhaps cover some of the material in the Q&A. Right, because I'm not even covered like 10% of it. Right, fair enough. 
<laughs> yeah, I said we have a lot, a lot of work to do. <laughs> right, yeah. Um, please, yeah. Okay, so if you could end the share screen and we go back to our normal Zoom screen, I would appreciate that. Uh, yes, yeah, sure. Thank you. And now mm -hmm. I would like to introduce our discussant this afternoon, uh, Anna Calori, who is a historian whose work focuses on the history of economic cooperation in the non-aligned movement. She's lecturer in contemporary economic history at the School of Social and Political Sciences, University of Glasgow. Before joining Glasgow, she was a Marie Curie co-fund postdoctoral research fellow at the University of Virginia, uh, Vienna, Vienna. <laughs> And she's part of a collaborative research project titled Uzam, a Socialist Workplace in Post-Colonial Africa, funded by the Austrian Research Fund. Her recent publications include Cigar Socialism, an Entangled History of Yugoslav-Cuban Relations, what was published in Cold War History, and Global Bridges, Local Ruins, Rethinking Socialist Spaces Through the Experience of Non-Aligned Enterprises. Anna, Thank you for interrupting the conference that you are attending to join us in the seminar. The screen is all yours. Thanks a lot for um, the introduction. And um, well, um, I will try to maybe do a little bit of, of justice, I guess, to uh, some of what are, are Rudy's points uh, um, in the book, and then I will get to some of the questions. So I think this is this is a fantastic, uh, um, very very uh, um, extensive diplomatic history that tells us a very very intricate uh, um, story. And you know, in maybe in a in a parallel uh, uh, in a separate room, I'd, I'd like to ask Rudy how did he manage to unlock all of these archives and learn all these languages and read all these documents? Uh, it's really really impressive. Um, I think. So I'm I'm a historian of the non-aligned movement and of East-South relations. So I guess my comments are are obviously informed by my interests and my passions. And I think this book weaves excellently the complicated thread of socialist internationalism going back and forth the Atlantic and the Iron Curtain to show very intricate web of complex and often contradictory and really frustrating relations within the socialist world. Um, it shows us that uh, uh, the bloc, the CMEA, was, was far from being uniform and tensions really existed long and stark uh, between these allies. What I think is the most interesting aspect, at least for me, and I'm, I'm happy to engage with Rudy about it if, if I have misinterpreted it, is actually what we see as the massive global and relentless effort to achieve independence for a lot of these uh, um, small uh, states that we see kind of like always somehow overshadowed by uh, uh, the two big uh, uh, powers of the Cold War. So um, this independence is political at first and immediately after, or almost immediately economic as well. And the book shows the difficulties of achieving independence for these smaller countries tied in these very hierarchical geopolitical relations of dependency from, from richer and more powerful uh, countries. So we see that there is a kind of like a colossal military, diplomatic, economic endeavor of shifting the power imbalances between the West and the rest, between the imperial core and the post-colonial world. Uh, and this emerges very vividly uh, um, in the book. And the book shows that uh, um, the myriad of contradictions that existed in this in this attempt, and it also shows that um, in the quest for for independence of Cuba, in this case, uh, um, actually results in a in a new form of skewed dependency from the Eastern Bloc, and I think this is a very very important insight in um, of the book, and I think actually it would be limiting to see. Uh, uh, the obstinance of some of these books' protagonists is just blinding ideology. Um, the book shows, however, that uh, their convictions are very forceful, and it shows also from multiple perspectives the, the struggles, violences, losses and victories of internationalism as a national ideology. So enough with the, with the praises, now let's get to, to the questions. <laughs> um, I think the first one is... So from the way you describe the attitude of many of the Eastern European actors towards Cuba, 
it seems that they had some sort of civilizational idea about the island and their position in it. They thought they could somewhat, quote unquote, teach communism or modernization or planning to the Cubans. Was that the case? Did the Cubans react to, to this or, or reject this, uh, uh, this attitude? And what does this tell us about perhaps the racial or colonial tropes that Eastern Europeans may have reproduced in their interactions with their comrades in Havana? Um, should I ask all my questions or should, I, uh, should we do a back and forth? Why don't we do a back and forth? So, Rudy, if you could weigh in succinctly uh, on that, uh, and then we'll move on to the next question. Thank you, uh, Anna, for presenting my book. <laughs> I appreciate it. Uh, so, uh, basically, the question of civilizational mission uh, touches upon the, the educational uh, aspects of it. Uh, so, uh, originally, uh, and I was a part of one of the slides, uh, thank you for asking this question, because it was part of one of the slides uh, that, that followed um, the, the, the event uh, timeline, uh, it was the socialist diplomats realizing, again, the potential, the peril uh, on the ground, they volunteered to upgrade themselves. No one was there to tell them, yes, you need to go and uh, educate, educate, that was the term, uh, the Cubans, what they should do. Uh, their, their original mandate was to gather information and the represents and to create foster links, economic, uh, political. That was the, that was the, 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 the ground, that was the, the, the baseline. Uh, however, a real uh, understanding the 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 the, the, the Peculiarities of Cuba's uh, location, only ninety miles off Key West. Uh, realizing that that its importance as a, as a, as a prestige uh, project, as it were, uh, in in the very early nineteen sixties, and then meeting and acquainting with Castro himself, they need that they would have a lot of work to do. But in nineteen sixty two in October, they realized as well that they cannot do it in the right, direct way. They are to do it in, in, in a certain respect, in a more, mm, in a way that it will not be like a giving direct open advice, but more of a, like a camaraderie suggestion. Uh, one telling example of this is uh, the way the Cubans dealt with ambassadors, and particularly Soviet ambassadors that they didn't like. One of them was Kudrazov. Uh, the other one was like uh, so They didn't like this uh, uh, uptight in, in their, their mindset uh, behavior uh, of the career diplomat that would tell them you do A and we do B. Now it was it had to be informal. It had to be in a way they they would digest so that they, they it doesn't touch on their sensitivities. And then uh, this might sound a little bit odd, but looking back. Cubans might not have been the best learners when they didn't want to learn something, but they were probably out there one of the best inventors. And this tells a lot about how they wanted to go about things, not to be taught, not to be civilized. And a great deal of pride, and that goes as well. Uh, back in the way Castro was portraying himself, it was not like Marxist Leninist, it was like more of a Marxist Amartiano. So uh, the idea of, meld of Marxism with uh, the Cuban uh, patriotism is something that they wouldn't uh, go about. Uh, so in another slide, don't touch upon again uh, this uh, topic of them being educated is, yes, we would allow you to tell us, but then we will internalize the processes. And that process of internalization uh, touches upon a very important tenet in, uh, in socialist uh, uh, internationalism, which was peaceful coexistence. Peaceful coexistence, and one of the guys who was teaching them, and we, we could, you could see it in the writing, uh, was like a Bulgarian Tony Zhevko. He was selling in 1973, I think it was like in, in June, saying, right, you don't have to wage war with the guys you hate. You need to respect them, 
and you need to wait for your moment to come when you gather your strength. And how you do that? First, sort out your house, sort out the ground, sort out your economy. We go there, and from that point, there was the, the tactical approach we know from the earlier decades of the, of, the, of the 20th century. We know how horribly wrong they went. But that was the, the doctrinal education. And then I will just finish with that. Uh, Castro, uh, you know, they need to basically go about this. The, 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 this topic of uh, waging peace with the Americans. They couldn't imagine themselves doing it. And, and we see uh, this mm, dialectic conversation with themselves as spelled out by, uh, by reporters, by diplomatic reporters. Uh, and even in between themselves, they were trying to say, how are we going to uh, persuade them that the things they were doing in, in Spanish, there is like a very nice saying, the ronda cabeza. You're going to break your uh, head. You don't break your head. And teaching Castro not to break his head figuratively, it was something that took probably about five years. And it culminated with 1975 with the, with the Congress of the party, which was formed uh, 10 years prior, but it took 10 years for them to come up with the Congress. And what a Congress it was. Uh, it was all bells and whistles, hope and circumstance, you name it. It was the highest point. I cannot click back to this uh, dreadful slide, which took me four hours uh, just to go to the middle. Sorry. But it was like the highest point on the sentiment scale uh, I prepared for you. Uh, it was the moment where Hungarians, Polish, is German recognized? We are getting there. That was three years already after uh, the, the, the exception, the uh, admittance to the, the CMA. So basically, uh, Anna, just to go back to um, the, the, the conversation of the, the civilizational mission, the educational mission, it was more de de designed to be a coexistence camaraderie coexistence. Uh, but we'll see probably if we get to that point in the late 80s, how it all unraveled and how we go, how the house of cards crumbled. I hope I answered somehow the question. Anna? Yes, thank you so much. This is uh, this is really insightful. And the, the question of peaceful coexistence can be impacted in so many different ways. And uh, um, it's also, you know, one of the mottos of the non-aligned movement. And at the same time, you know, we see a lot of these countries engaging in not so peaceful coexistence after all, right? As you wonderfully show in the in the chapter on, on Cubans in Angola. So um, I, how many more questions can I ask? I guess that's that's my question to the moderators. I have a couple more. Please, please yeah, proceed. Okay, excellent. So um, for my second question, I would like to ask you if you could uh, um, unpack the tensions that existed within the Cuban leadership beyond Castro and the Castro brothers and the higher echelons of the party. So, um, and did the, did the um, diplomats and, and actors that you look at from Eastern Europe seek to at times exploit maybe these, these tensions and contradictions that existed uh, um, within the, uh, the Cuban leadership um, for their own interests? And if not, then what does that tell us about the Cuban leadership itself? Thanks. Thank you for this question. You nailed it. That's, uh, and again, I'm going to go back to the uh, the ground view. What do I mean by that? East European diplomats were more often than not crossed with, uh, with their Cuban hosts for more reasons than what. One of the reasons was Cuban leaders, once they receive dignitaries, party leaders from Eastern Europe and Soviet Union, they would present abundance of greatness. Uh, they would present a situation that was rosier uh, than the Rose Garden. We know which one. The problem the Eastern European uh, diplomats had with this approach was how little, how little push they could exert 
how little influence they could have, and how embarrassing the times their reporting could have been seen in the eyes of their superiors. Because, yes, uh, you've noticed, uh, uh, all of you, uh, the, the reference to Graham Greene. Warm oats, peculiar fella. He had to see things black. He had to see things in certain ways to arouse the interests uh, of the censor. Not saying Eastern European diplomats in their entirety or singularity read the book. And that's something that uh, Vlad Zubok spoke very eloquently uh, about the importance of portraying the situation on the ground in certain ways. So that to generate a uh, higher turnover for the particular bureaucratic um, end, be it from the mm, security services, uh, be it from the mid or uh, the foreign ministries, be it from the, uh, the foreign trade ministries, they needed to have a problem to solve. Obviously, that was not something, uh, Cubans wanted to have a problem that was not of their making. And that comes back to the, to the Cuban, Cuban leadership. Uh, we could argue the Cuban leadership was a duumvirate between Raul and Fidel. How this played out? From early on, and I would say as early as 1952, that's early, when uh, Raul uh, met with a certain guy by the name of Leonov. We know this guy. Uh, uh, everybody in the audience uh, knows uh, his um, role in, uh, in the security services, uh, particularly in the KGB. And, in, uh, and, and then uh, in, in, in just, uh, they, they met the stories like, you know, quite, quite long. Uh, they were both uh, uh, rule uh, in in, uh, in in Europe for different reasons, uh, and then they met on 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 a ship as uh, Leon Nicole Leonov was going to Mexico to study Spanish, and then the, the first thing he recognized in this curious guy from from Cuba was there was like he was speaking about communism as a real communist, as a guy who believed in it. Initially, uh, the Soviets didn't recognize that in his uh, uh, senior brother. Raul was, as time went, uh, recognized as the guy they, they could trust and in a way they could reason with. And we know the, the brothers never traveled together. We know there are reasons for that. Uh, but we know when we track the, 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 the trips, the foreign trips, we know oftentimes Castro would go, and when we go through the, the transcripts, there will, there will, the conversation will be all over the place uh, with the senior Castro. And they will talk about a lofty ideas, they will talk about uh, a bright future, and the roadmap, that would be all over the place. Conversations with Raul were completely different. They were to the point. A very nitty gritty. He would share uh, how the Soviets, for example, were uh, instructing, is a very strong word, advising probably would be better, how to deal with the Yugoslavs, uh, you know well about. Uh, how would they go about to mention, probably to stick in, sneak in a mention about the Soviet Union in, in a, a community case here and there around the times where Cuba was a dot with the Yugoslavs within the non-aligned movement. So they, this was a part of the, this was this was part and parcel of the conversations they had with with, with Raul. Uh, that the junior Castro was uh, the guy to have the, the, the job done. Uh, the senior Castro was the one who would announce the job. How did they do that? Simple. They had around May Day. They had around uh, end July uh, big rallies. Form of a, like, a, I'll push the envelope here, a, a direct democracy. I know it's heretic. Uh, they will proclaim a new course of action. That was Castro's role. Behind the scenes, it was, oh, it was the economic czar, it was Carlos Rafael. Carlos Rafael was not the right hand of rule, but was one of a very trusted guy within the Soviets. Carlos Rafael, 
uh, I should say Carlos Rafael uh, Rodriguez, um, but uh, we know from those uh, times of the revolution and they would tend to always refer to them and insist referring them on uh, in the familiar terms. So Carlos Rafael Rodriguez, he was the one in 1969. He was the one who was sent to the uh, the communist party, uh, the communist party's meetings uh, in Moscow. He was not Raúl. He was Carlos Rafael. Uh, so he was uh, a guy whom the Russians could speak to. So basically, in 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 the the top leadership uh, and the top leaders in the, the very close uh, knit uh, Cuban leadership, uh, the most of the the, the decision making was held in a very tight uh, circle, in a very tight, and the tightest of circles, I should say. And also, uh, that was the reason I mentioned the Jungerate, uh scenario, because uh, they were like, you know, left hand, right hand, and when always, always, the left hand knew what the right one was doing. Surely, surely, the Soviets knew about this dynamic. Did they exploit it? Question is, we did okay. When Che was uh, Che Guevara, when was uh, still there, he was not an easy fellow to work with. Uh, not only for the Russians, for the Soviets and the Eastern Europeans, uh, but we know for the Castro too as well. Um, he wasn't the one that was uh, seen as probably an. Uh, outlet as, an, uh, as, a, as, a, as a weak link, however left he was on, on the scale. Uh, but things were quite, uh, should I say, simplified uh, in, 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 uh, from the late, uh, late 60s. And that's all I actually put on, uh, on the sentiment chart. I put uh, Aníbal Escalante. Uh, and then that would tell you the pushback. The pushback Cubans uh, were exerting at any attempt, uh, at any attempt of the Soviets uh, telling them what and how to do it. Um, so after purging Escalante, he had a brief stint returning at the times when uh, ideological and political uh, East and Cuba were in better terms, but didn't pick up from where he left. So basically, uh, the stamp of disapproval, disapproval, once there, remains forever. Uh, so uh, just to, to wrap this up, the coexistence, the, the, the camaraderie, the, the camaraderie coexistence that ex existed between the two sides, they knew the limits and how much they can push each other. Uh, and playing uh, was not the one that would have been allowed by the by the Cubans. And we know that. We know that for fact it was in the in the 70s. Uh, no, I shouldn't say 70s, like I think 1970 was the time when um, the Institute of Public Generality was like documents, so, so a series of documents from uh, from the covered representation, covered representation, what that's uh, from the covered agents, which were obviously we know these are announced ones, these are the ones which the Cubans knew, accepted them as such, uh, who were complaining. From the uh, from the Cuban counterintelligence, why? Because they they had inkling, they had an idea, they had probably a feeling uh, that the, the the Polish and other Eastern Europeans were trying probably to meddle a little bit too much uh, within the top leadership circles. So what the the way they did it, the way the Cuban counterintelligence was push, uh, and in this. Uh, push and pull uh, that was developed throughout this uh, three decades. Uh, both sides learned basically how to respect each other and how much to push and how much to let pull from the other side to push. Uh, and this kind of like, you know, very long explanation uh, makes sense of the very complex uh, uh, situation under the very top leadership level. Thank you. Anna? Uh, thanks a lot. A very Quick question, and then I'm, I'm happy to to open for the Q and A. Um, there is perhaps a contentious point in your book. Internationalism costs money, and it costs the Cubans a lot. Is this a crude vision, or are indeed the hierarchies of of international solidarity ultimately shaped by financial calculations and financial constraints? Thanks. You're on fire today. So, Castro had a very important 
meeting with, uh, I think, yeah, Stavro Zhivkov, 1976, months after Carlotta was launched. And he said one thing to him, yes, we can help with trips. We can help with uh, probably relating to the local population. We cannot help with money. We need money. We need you to help us financially so that we can continue uh, the spread of the socialist ideas. You cannot commit trips. We can, but we don't have the money to do it. Castro was directly pressing on Zhivko and saying, all of you Eastern European states, including, no, he didn't mention the Soviets, you want to extract uh, uh, Angola's uh, richness to get uh, whatever you can get of it. We want to help develop it. Uh, and the, the, his words were, that was uh, in 1976, was words, uh, we won the war, now we need to win the peace. You know who he was referring to, who was referencing rather. Interestingly or not, Zhivkov, almost in verbatim, repeated the sentiment of what Castro told him. What this comes to tell me is, um, and he told this uh, none other but Kirilenko. Uh, Kirilenko was at the time in 1976 with, with Brezhnev's diminishing faculties and with all these problems within uh, the Soviet leadership. He was uh, as a notable voice and he was a notable voice in particular with, with the Horn of Africa and in Africa uh, uh, at large. Uh, so he was, uh, Zhivko was speaking to the right ears. And Kirilenko's answer was, he was in agreement. He agreed that uh, the economic aspect of it was important. But what was left in this conversation, very telling as it was, first on the, on the, on, on the first conversation we had with uh, uh, Castro and Zhivkov and then Zhivkov and, and, and Kirilenko, the things were not finished off. They, they, uh, they saw where the problem was. Internationalism cost a lot of money. It cost a lot of money to the, to the Cubans. Uh, there were like some estimations by uh, other authors that a, a great deal. I, I will cite of uh, a number which might not be uh, reflecting the truth, so not so personal with the number, but uh, a good deal of money that was coming by by means of subsidy, price subsidies. Uh, it was basically put back in uh, by the Cubans with their uh, exploits around the world. Uh, yes, they had some revenue. Uh, via the, the medical personnel. Uh, but that was, again, more of a, an exercise of uh, showing they can do it. And they have something to, to not something, but a, 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 a considerable uh, considerable aspect uh, of their own um, to contribute to this socialist, socialist capitalist peace and coexistence. Uh, so at the end of the day, both parties both parties, when I speak parties, that may say, when I say parties, that uh, some sort of like, you know, other ends of the, the, the spectrum, but they were partners. I mean, the, the, the Cubans and the Eastern Europeans and the, the Soviets realized that cost money. And not to forget, in the, the times which we now refer to as uh, Brezhnev's folly, which is uh, the Horn of Africa, later of Af uh, Afghanistan, which falls on another later and a different uh, era in the Soviet leadership. Uh, these were times where petrol rubles was flying all over the place. They had uh, they had the resource, but they didn't have that much of a resource, and that was part of the problem for the Cubans. And and to finish with this, and I want to mention something very important, something very important that was from earlier days, but resonates uh, in the times of the 1970s. In the late 60s, Castro referred to, to the Soviet leadership as grandchildren of revolutionaries. Castro uh, saw himself as a bona fide revolutionary, as not as a grand child, not as a son of a revolutionary, but as a first generation generation revolutionary. For this uh, revolution, that's the way he saw himself. Money didn't matter at all. What mattered was the ideal. Uh, 
yet in his majority view of uh, his Eastern, Eastern partners, they were already almost as close as capitalists. And that was the great uh, uh, cognitive dissonance be that existed uh, be between them. And that caused quite a bit of friction uh, starting uh, in, in late 70s. Um, yeah. Thank you. All right. If folks in our audience have questions, you can use the raise hand function, in which case I call on you, uh, or you can type your question into the Q and A. Um, I have a number of questions, uh, and I will take co-chair's prerogative to, to pose them. Um, the book does a very good job at tracing kind of the ebbs and flows of East Bloc frustrations with the Cubans and at moments their excitement, uh, particularly with regard to foreign policy in Angola and uh, uh, Ethiopia. Um, but at one point, you you offer an example of the Czechoslovak uh, uh, interior minister who visits Havana in 1976, and he offers the following that utterly perplexes me. Um, Surely I would like to say that we could express all of our impressions in one sentence. Cuba plus socialist order equals heaven on earth. It is an example for all Latin American countries, for all countries and peoples who value their revolutionary traditions, dot, dot, dot. And so maybe it was the rum. Maybe it was too much sun. Um, maybe he was trying to please his superiors in some way. But there's not much in the book from uh, on the domestic side um, that would lead to such a um, over-the-top assessment on the part of an East Bloc functionary uh, or diplomat. Uh, and so I'm perplexed uh, at how anyone could look at the Cuban economy, even when sugar prices are doing better or better than they were before, you know, given the economic dependence, which is, you know, total or almost total uh, on Soviet aid, which is not how the Cubans saw it. It's like, that's your responsibility um, and trade uh, at subsidized prices. So how could that assessment be offered uh, in any credible kind of way? So that one perplexed me. Okay. Thank you very much, Eric. That was another slide which you didn't have to see. Yes, thank you. You already covered it with Anna's questions and, and yours. We covered the presentation. Uh, our business, uh, business in 1976 was uh, indeed a very curious one. Maybe a little bit, uh, a little bit of uh, context needs to be shared. Before he went to Cuba, he was talking, talking with Mengistu in the Horn of Africa. So he had a bit of a comparison to make. Um, so I, I already mentioned uh, that uh, diplomats, uh, East European diplomats, uh, oftentimes complain about how the Cubans, Cuban leaders, were playing tricks on them. So, for example, uh, in private conversations, uh, those conversations are private, they would say, we don't have this, we need this and that. Uh, this tracts are broke. Uh, the, uh, we are, you name it. I mean, the shopping list of problems, they were painting uh, in front of them so that they could extract a little bit more. And then when a guy of a high rising king functionary comes, everything flips around. You have the Cuban charm a full display. Uh, not showing the, the ugly part, it's showing the beautiful part. And at the time when a uh, business uh, visited, uh, it was when already Cuban economy as dependent as it was on, uh, uh, on, on the Eastern Bloc, there were already examples, uh, very important examples of, uh, of the economy is it picking up. So uh, a hallmark of the Soviets, uh, and we recognize this from uh, other parts of the world, is building um, a signature project, projects that would be visible from afar. So kind of like you know, a house of cards 
uh, prestige, uh, a, a, a bacon of hope project, uh, a cement plant in one town in Cienfuegos, or in, um, a housing building plant in, in other town. And basically those were the places they were shown around. So it was a yeah. If I if I if I'm cynical as I am, I would say it was like a big charade. I was just like pulling the charade. And when you're coming from Ethiopia, and that's Ethiopia in 1976, you have a comparison to make. And you know that there are countries of socialist orientation and countries of socialist orientation, and the differences in the emphasis. And at the time. Peru was already being a socialist country. Uh, so then we have a play of contrast. And you could say the same with the way Jip Kvodo was not spelled out. I use particularly uh, the, the Czechoslovak uh, mm, quote, the Czechoslovak uh, interior minister quotes, because it was very stark. It was, it was very uh, unique in its, in its own merit given how difficult the situation is. And basically they exemplified this dialectic uh, tango they had. We know in a dance, in a tango, there's always one that leads in the relationship that developed between the, the Cuban hosts and the Eastern European diplomats. It wasn't the one who led. And that was the problem. And one of the examples of it was exactly the old business uh, visit, which you, you so well picked up on. Thank you. Thank you. We are running out of time, but we have a question from Megan Easley Walsh, who asks, while every country's history is, of course, different, there is one element, uh, is there one element that you think is specifically unique to the Cold War era in relation to Cuba, something that could only have happened or did happen there, for example? This is a type of a $64,000 question, isn't it? Right. Cuba, from the start, was seen as the improbable success. The inception of, of the, the, the rebel army, its march into Havana, uh, the, 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 the uniqueness of this audacity to launch uh, something that at the time wasn't labeled as, as a revolution by the East in itself was a unique event in the history. Another uh, uh, history at large, the way it was, because we received uh, in, in late 1959, the sentiments which I so much looked on, uh, upon uh, gradually, uh, gradually, and then suddenly a uh, change in favor of the Cubans and geographic uh, fatalism that uh, gripped uh, Cuban history and uh, the early stages of the economy, uh, the economy, the early stages of uh, uh, the revolution, basically is this one unique factor that made it so important for the bloc to stick on it. Uh, historians love to play with counterfactuals, I heard. And one major counterfactual here is what if this revolution happened in Chile. Oh, wait, it happened, sort of. But did it last? That's not a counterfactual. We know what happens. So if I have to single out one, it would be that. A second that would make it so uh, so so important was uh, the, the, the willingness of the Cubans to push back. We haven't, we, we've seen it, uh, 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 I've studied a, a few countries, not, not that many, but from the, the, the ones I, I've studied already, we've seen similar pushback in, uh, uh, in Ethiopia. To a certain extent, we, uh, and actually to a larger extent, we've seen it in, in Somalia. But there were differences, the differences in the, the unity, the leadership unity, the Cubans uh, uh, the, the displayed, uh, basically, it was. I'm not really sure because it wasn't part of. Uh, I was not looking in the right place. I wasn't part of the, the design I was going for of, the, of this particular project. Uh, how this unity was achieved, 
uh, and the methods I was achieved are also did it completely different projects. Uh, but from Mikoyan, from the early days and months of the, 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 of the, of the, the, the revolution, the difference is already on display. And that was the fact that that, uh, that, that survived to, to the end of the, the very end and the very end of the, this, this uh, a long and winding relationship. Uh, one might say is 1988, although the, the, the Hong Kong was disbanded three years later, which is when the Soviets and Cuba signed the, the, the Friendship Treaty. Not in 1980, uh, as the East Germans, in 1988. So the residual thinking of this uh, uh, a fearless, uh, as uh, superlatively as, as it sounds, uh, nation, which had the, 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 the audacious uh, um, chance, probably, <laughs> and, and the risk-taking abilities to do what they did uh, in the later 50s, lived through this three decades, and was uh, the glue that bonded them for so long. Thank you. A final question. Um, oh, it just disappeared here. Um, but uh, when it did appear in my Q&A, uh, it was simply, um, uh, how many Cubans died uh, in the African um, uh, engagements uh, in the 1970s? And is there an assessment uh, of how the Cuban people responded to or felt about um, that, uh, here we go, uh, felt about uh, those adventures. And that'll be our final uh, question. Uh, thank you uh, as well for the question. I cannot say the number. Uh, I cannot say the number, but it was in the tens of thousands. That's uh, a number which I did not uh, remember from primary documents, because I think it was not a, a topic, uh, it was something that the Cubans wanted to share, so open, very openly, um, not to mark on their invincibility or immortality, uh, probably just to... On the other hand, Cuban, uh, the Cuban public at large was, we know, and that was uh, also shared in several conversations, uh, with, uh, with the Polish uh, security services operator, uh, with, uh, with an unnamed uh, Cuban diplomat, who was painting a rather grim picture uh, within uh, the, the society as regards to uh, these excursions, this, these military excursions in, in faraway Africa. Uh, so apparently, yes, some earnings could have been had, or uh, as a part of the material incentive, uh, but uh, greatly it was not uh, a positive venture. It was not a venture that was seen so uh, uh, something that they were ready to go there and die for their uh, African brethren. Thank you. I have to draw this session to a close, but I do want to thank Rudy, Anna, and Christian, uh, as well as the Wilson Center's Kennan Institute for its co-sponsorship this afternoon. Christian. Over to you for final words. Thank you. My thanks as well to you, Rudy and Anna, for some good questions to try to bring out some of these points. And of course, Eric, um, let me just remind you um, two events of the Washington History Seminar next week. On Monday, we have Sheda Yambani's The Poverty of the World, Rediscovering the Poor at Home and Abroad. That's on the 23rd. And then on Thursday, the 26th, we have Kedara Williams, I Saw Death Coming, A History of Terror and Survival in the War Against Reconstruction, an AHA-sponsored session of our series. Until then, thank you all. We're adjourned. Have a good night. Take care.